Good evening and a very warm welcome to First Issues, as in this segment we discuss the ugly truth about wasting good food. A recent study reveals that British households alone throw away the equivalent of 300 billion pula worth of food every year. This equates to about 18 million tons of food wastage. The study by Waste Resources Action Programme revealed that people are more likely to throw away certain food products over others. According to an article published in South African newspaper, The Sunday Times, the study also singled out 10 items which households are binning every week without fail. Among these are bananas, milk, bacon, fizzy drinks, bread, chicken and poultry, potatoes, homemade meals and chips. Tonight, with the assistance of our expert food safety consultant and trainer, Nina Hamid, we would like to share with you how to make the most common foods last longer, which could save you your hard-earned cash, as well as cut down on waste. What is the difference between use by, fail by, and best before? So the best before dates are usually on products which have a longer shelf life. There'll be tin products, packet products, those kind of things, bottle products, and so on. So the use by date is for perishable products. The best before date is for long-term shelf dried preserved products. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, the best before date is more about the quality. The quality of this product will be best before the end of that date. Okay. So for example, on here it says best before 5th of December 2017. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't buy this product today unless I know I'm going to use it within the next week or within the next few days because it's already towards the end of its best quality date. So try to look for products which have a longer shelf life. For example, like this one is November 2019. Mm -hmm. So it's still got, you know, quite a long time. Sometimes they'll also put on the date of the manufacturing or the packaging on there. That gives you an indication. If it was packed in 2015 and now we're in 2017 and this is expiring in December, it means it's right at the end of its quality, best quality time. Mm -hmm. And also if the tins are damaged in any way, if it's dented or rusty, the label's fallen off, again, don't purchase those because the products inside might be compromised. If the can is bloated, you know, like blown up, that's an indication that there's some infection going on in there. So that will be in relation to food safety, not just quality. A recent study from the UK yeah. says certain food items are more likely to be wasted than others. Mm -hmm. uh, they listed products such as milk, yeah. uh, such as bananas and bread and bacon as well. Yeah. Do you have any tips as to how to prolong the shelf life of these um, commonly wasted foods okay. or maybe some uses yeah. um, um, that could reduce food wastage after their best uh, before date? Like uh, we were saying earlier, and the food wastage occurs either because people have purchased more than they can possibly store safely in their uh, freezer or fridge or you know, dry goods storeroom, or because they're not uh, able to use it within the period of time. Uh, so they're over-purchasing it. So either poor storage or over-purchasing will lead to food wastage. Secondly, when people are preparing food, the way they trim and prepare the raw vegetables and things, a lot of wastage can occur there if people are not careful mm. with, you know, removing the peels and things like that. Uh, thirdly, if um, something like bread uh, is starting to go moldy or starting to go stale and dry, um, first of all, you question why is it going moldy? Mm. It's because of poor storage. Again, if it's been kept in warm damp, moist conditions, it will start going mold, moldy. So the best thing is that I portion it and I freeze it. So I'll keep like four slices in each packet. So if I do need it, and if I have visitors, I can pull out more than two packets. Um, so that will prolong the shelf life of that um, bread or pastry product. Uh, the other thing to do would be to use it for a dish. You know, you can make breadcrumbs to make your own fish cakes or 
Turkish fingers or whatever it is you want to cook. So, or you can make a bread and butter pudding, those kind of things you can use. This is when it's no longer as fresh as maybe you would... Yes, yeah, if it's starting to go a bit dry and stale. Mm. But things like bananas and so on, we live in a very hot country, as you know, and the weather's quite warm. So normally bananas are not kept in, cold, in, a, in a fridge. So here you do need to keep them in a fridge, but at a temperature slightly higher than you would keep your dairy products and your meat products and cooked meat products, for example. Mm -hmm. So usually the temperature, like I, I have a separate fridge for my fruits, and that is uh, set at you know, around 10, 12 degrees. It's not as cold as my other fridge, which is below five degrees. Um, in you know, hotels and places like that, they have uh, a vegetable cold room kind of thing, cool room where they keep their vegetables. So uh, with bananas, if they're starting to go soft, again, they can still be consumed or they can be made into smoothies or into you know, milkshakes or something like that, banana bread, curry cake, whatever you want to make with it. With regards to meat, how do we retain its nutritional value? When you are going to use the raw meat, the import most important thing in relation to food safety is making sure you defrost it properly and thaw it out completely before cooking it. Mm. That way, um, and again, when you're throwing out the meat and things, put it into a colander with a container underneath so that the drips can go in there. It's not sitting in its juices and all the water that's coming out of it. Okay. So remove it from its packaging, put it into a container, on to, you know, in a colander on top of another container to collect the juices. That's where most of the nutritional value will be retained in that meat. But if you put it in uh, the freezer where you're starting to get frostbite on it and build up of ice, then as that's defrosting, because more juices and more water is being produced from the melting ice, mm. you're going to start losing some of the nutrition from it, from into those juices. What is the future of help? It's to help people find the great in themselves. The drive, the passion help them find their true potential, help them stretch, help them grow. That's why we help people help themselves, help the world, because a little help goes a long, long way. FNB, how can we help you? Welcome back to First Issues as we continue to speak to food safety consultant and trainer Nina Hamid about how to reduce food wastage. How does defrosting it uh, away from its own juices retain the nutritional value? What is no. the harm of keeping it in its own? Okay, that's not to do with the nutritional value, it's more to do with the safety. Okay. Because when you freeze raw meat or poultry, it will automatically be frozen with bacteria present on it. Mm -hmm. So if it's sitting in that uh, container, plastic bag or whatever it is, the juices that are defrosting and things, the bacteria are not killed in the freezer. Mm -hmm. They just become dormant. Mm -hmm. They go to sleep. So as soon as you raise the temperature, they become active and they start multiplying. Mm -hmm. So if it's sitting in that juices, your meat will end up with more bacteria so that when you're doing the normal cooking process, you might not be able to kill it off to bring it to a safe level. Another, um, other food items that made it onto the list of most wasted foods mm. in the home uh, included surprisingly fizzy drinks and potatoes. Mm. Um, do you have advice with regards to those food items? With fizzy drinks, again, when you're purchasing it, look at the date. Um, the fizzy drinks don't... They get wasted because people buy, say, the two-litre bottle of Sprite or Fanta or Coke or something like that. They drink half of it, they don't tighten the lid, and if they leave it, you know, un half tightened or something, the fizziness goes. But the drink itself is still drinkable. There's nothing wrong with it. It just won't taste the same because it doesn't have the fizz anymore. Yeah. Um, potatoes start to rot if they have been the structure has been damaged in any way. So it, same with an apple or a banana, you know, pear or something like that. If you drop it and you bruise it, it's going to start rotting much quicker than if it's kept wholesome. 
Um, the problem with potatoes is you must keep them in a dark, cool place. Mm. So usually if you see when the potatoes come from the farms, they will be in a brown paper bag. But then we transfer it into a plastic bag when we purchase a few or even the retailers. They're putting it into the plastic bag and that doesn't keep it covered and kept in the, in the sort of um, dark place. So again, potatoes should be stored in a basket or something which is put into a cupboard and not left out in the light and they will last longer. But um, if they start sprouting or start going green under the skin, that means there's poison being developed. So you must peel those potatoes to remove the green and to remove the sprouts before you can cook them. So it's still safe to consume? Still safe to consume because you're going, you don't eat raw potatoes. You're still going to cook it, so it's still safe to eat. Yeah. What do you make of the debate as to whether vegetables keep their nutritional values, uh, whether frozen or not? Uh, and you also did touch on meat mm. and meat products getting frostbite and losing their nutritional uh, value within the freezer. Mm. Is there a way to retain a food's nutritional value in a fr yes. during freezing? Yes, anything that is fresh will obviously um, will be nutritious, but remember we have very little fresh produce in Botswana at the moment. From the time the farmers cultivate and pick the vegetables to the time it's transported to the wholesalers, to the retailers, to our homes, it's already maybe a week or 10 days old. So it's not as nutritious as if you pluck it from the tree. Secondly, with certain frozen, well, most frozen vegetables, they are more nutritious if again they're maintained properly in the freezer, right? More nutritious. They're more nutritious than a fresh one at times. Like I said, unless you're picking fresh mm -hmm. from the ground and eating it, these ones are more nutritious because they have been blanched and then frozen, quick frozen immediately. Mm -hmm. Blanching means plunging into hot water to kill off the enzymes. Mm -hmm. So no enzyme reactions can take place. And because very little water has been used for putting in and for a very little short uh, period of time, all the nutrients are still in there. But when it comes to cooking the frozen vegetables, if you're now going to put them in loads of water and boil it for hours, mm. you're going to lose all the nutritional value. How do we retain? Steam it. Okay. With frozen veg, because they've already been par-cooked, you just need to steam it. You have a pot of boiling water underneath, colander with your vegetable, whichever it is, cover it up, let it steam for a few minutes and it's ready. If you are adding it to a dish, add it right towards the end, not at the beginning. So if you're making a stew with peas in it, you'd wait until the stew is almost cooked, two, three minutes before, you know, you would add these and they'll be ready within those minutes. And finally, what harm is there in eating food that's well past its um, shelf life? If you do consume something that's past its I know you said there's no exp expiry date. Written. We don't use expiry dates on food <laughs> products, yes. Yeah. Um, again, I, if I just reiterate the fact that depending on the type of product, if it's a high-risk food product like your meat and poultry, and you know whether it's cooked or raw, it, you must use those within the specified period of time. But if it's uh, other products like your tins and your packet stuff and you know lentils and things like that, it will be fine for another you know week, two weeks, or even a month. Uh, to consume it afterwards. So it really depends on the type of product. I can't give you a specific date for anything. It depends on what it is. Understood. I just yeah. wanted to highlight some of the risks that do come with consuming maybe milk and uh, poultry, those high risk items yes. um, after they are best before, or even vegetable products a year or so after they are best before. Exactly. What physical or health risks does somebody with the high-risk food products, the risk is for getting food poisoning, which is your normal vomiting and diarrhea symptoms, okay? With uh, the other products, it's the nutritional value, like I said. You're not going to benefit from eating that product. Mm -hmm. The taste, the quality, the you know, appearance, everything will be compromised. So, especially your fruits and vegetables. You know, we eat fruits and vegetables for the vitamins and minerals, mainly. And if they've been kept for a long period of time, you're not really going to benefit from that. And food poisoning can be quite severe. Mm. 
it can lead to death as well. People have died from food poisoning. So that's why things like your raw chicken, like I said, or raw meat, before cooking it, it is very, very important to defrost it and throw it out completely before starting to cook. What is the future of help? It's to help people find the great in themselves. The drive, the passion, help them find their true potential, help them stretch, help them grow. That's why we help people help themselves, help the world, because a little help goes a long, long way. FNB, how can we help you? Welcome back to First Issues. Consumers tend to throw caution to the wind in the excitement of the festive season, be it in their driving, spending, and in the consumption of food and beverages. Professor Kieran Bagat reminds us that it is not just the momentary heartburn, stomach aches, and hangovers that we need to be concerned about as a result of our overindulgence. But the longer-term health effects that come with consuming excess sugar, salt, fat, and alcohol. Those living with chronic illnesses especially are encouraged to be extra vigilant during such times. And if we talk about the various things that, 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 that we poison ourselves with over festive seasons, um, there are three major things that the body craves. One is salt, the other is sugar, and the third is fat. We know the food industry has cottoned on to the fact that our taste buds love those three and they love them in a mixture of those three. So if you think about the things that you love to eat, they're chips with lots of salt and lots of oil. So they've been fried chips with salt. And the body craves that. The body craves the smell of that vinegar. And you just keep eating those chips. So you're, you're consuming excess salt, you're consuming excess fat, and you're consuming excess carbohydrate just in a pocket of, of chips. If we talk about uh, sugary foods, the body, we know now from a lot of industry, uh, scientific industry related research, that sugar is more toxic and more addictive than cocaine. Now sugar, the food industry realizes, produces an instant fix. And the sugar is in everything, unfortunately, that the food industry produces, everything. You know, it's, it's, it's hidden. It's not necessarily in the, in the juices that we drink or the fizzy drinks that we consume, but it's also in the bread and it's in, in, in the pies, it's in the pasta, it's in the pizza. And don't let any part of the food industry fool you into saying that it's healthy. If it's processed, if it's in a box, it's unhealthy. If we take, for example, a can of soda, a soda drink, name any soda drink on the market and not to, to, to belittle any of the, the soda manufacturers in the country, but any soda drink contains a, a, a can of soda is anything between 8 to 10 teaspoons of sugar. Fruit sugars are just as poisonous, you know, and the food industry has got away with labeling things like 100% fruit, 100% fruit sugar. It's a cousin to glucose, which is, the, which is the sugar you put in your tea, and it is just as toxic. The problem with fructose, which is fruit sugar, is the body cannot break it down except in the liver. So if you consume excess amounts of fruit juice, you are putting your liver at an incredible amount of danger. We talk about alcohol producing liver damage. Fruit sugar can produce just as much fruit, uh, sugar damage. And people go about drinking these cans of fruit or liters of fruit, thinking, fruit juice, thinking that they're doing themselves healthy because they've read the label saying 100% uh, fruit and they're, they're poisoning themselves. The same with the smoothies on the market, the same with the low-fat yogurts because the way they've, rem the way they've made them low-fat is they've, ex they've removed the fat and added sugar. We should clearly stick to drinking water. Next we hear what some of the long-term hazards of overindulging in alcohol are. Now, alcohol is a difficult one because it gives you a feel-good factor and you want to celebrate, you want to commemorate, you want to go out and have a party. And, and, and one shouldn't forget also that, you know, a can of beer is literally a quarter of a loaf of bread in terms of calories. It's why we talk about a beer belly. And, and largely, we know that the fat around the stomach is the most poisonous. We know the fat around the stomach that you accumulate produces the most inflammatory 
chemicals in the body that causes heart attack, that causes stroke, that causes diabetes. It's not the fat around your bum, it's not the fat around your arm, it's not the fat around your face, it's the fat around your waist and this is where the calories go. So this is our problem when it comes to the festive season, that people do not know when to stop. And they throw away weeks and weeks or months and months of exercise of a restricted, relentless dietary program with a trainer going to the gym, reducing their caloric intake, and they throw it all away at, at one go. We also need to be mindful during the festive season of those people who are patients who are diabetic, who do have blood pressure, who've had a stroke, who've had heart failure, who are kidney patients, who also want to celebrate, but they are on pills. They are on blood pressure pills, they are on diabetic pills, they are on kidney failure pills, they are on insulin for injecting. For They have to be very cautious. One, because of the festive season, many doctors and hospitals are working on a low staff or on no staff at all and the, and the clinics are closed. So you have to make sure you have sufficient number of pills. You make sure that you have the number of your doctor or the number of your clinic. You make sure that you know what to do when there's an emergency. You know, many of our diabetics come in the new year with terribly high sugars because they've overindulged. And so the sugars are out of control. The kidneys are beginning to close down because the sugars are causing uh, toxicity of the kidneys. People with blood pressure have consumed vast quantities of salt. The blood pressure goes through the roof and they come with dizziness, they come with fainting, they come with uncontrolled blood pressure in spite of their pills. So make sure if you are a cardiac or a diabetic or any other type of patient, you have enough pills, you know your emergency numbers, you know which clinics are open and make sure you uh, uh, keep them in a safe place. To ensure that the merriment of the season continues, stay tuned for a card safety tip from FNB Botswana. Tepi Soshefers shares the do's and don'ts of card safety. We learn more ways to transact safely when using a bank card at a point of sale. Uh, another one is if you're in paying with your card, if it's not an ATM transaction, you're doing a point of sale transaction with your card, just never lose sight of your card. Always have the card within sight. Don't let anybody walk away with it. Ensure that even the pin, always enter your pin once. There's, for our f &B cards, you never need to enter your pin more than once. So if you're prompted to re-enter your pin, that's already a problem. So yeah, where a card transaction is declined, pause machine or ATM, always insist on getting the receipt. Uh, that shows that that transaction was actually declined because sometimes you have situations where the transaction was not declined and then you are made to do a second transaction. So just to be safe, always get the slip to prove that transaction was indeed not completed.